Hey, everybody. This is Doug Brudico with Auto Flies. I'm here today on the Beulah Fly Rod Fly Time broadcast. And we will be tying tonight with Bernie Weston. He's a Northern California fly tire who's been around a little bit. Um, tied with some uh, great fly tires that we'll get into um, a little bit. And tonight, Bernie's going to be tying the Muddled Euphoria, which is a really nice summer steelhead or low water winter steelhead fly. And uh, so, Bernie, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, cool. Um, hey, Doug, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> cool. Um, this, let's see, you know, I'll give you a little bit of my history first. Um, I started tying in uh, 1973, I think, when I was 12 years old. My dad got me a full adult herders. I think it was like a Thompson Marley Vice and all this kind of stuff. And I started getting pretty serious in the 80s, and then I really took off in the 90s. But over the years, in fact, where I met you the first time was in Grant King's shop. Remember? Oh, yeah. Days? No, I used to hang out in the mid the tiny room at Grant King shop. And Grant King taught me so many awesome techniques. I'm going to show you some of the stuff that he taught me here today. And then over the years, I became really good friends with um, Shane Stallcup. And this has been a really serious influence. It was um, a guy named Greg Sugar, and he used to manage Sweeney's over in Napa. And he was just an amazing fisherman. And he pushed me to, uh, to tie commercially for the spinet when it started to sink in and then um let's see so it, taking classes did you tie commercially trout flies or saltwater flies or what were you yeah doing commercially i tied um two very uh two variations of one of shane stalkup's pattern one was um a buyout betas it was on a 2499 spbl size 18 and mm -hmm. then the buyout wet fly which is pretty much the same fly but it had a really small medallion sheeting wing so that it looked like either a drowned adult or an ovipositing adult and that was like the killer pattern um before the stream bottom changed from flooding and silting and everything over at Peter Creek in the winter. I think I sold a uh, right. hundred dozen a year of those. Or so. It was unbelievable how much I did for those guys. So this fly right here, this is a fly that Rick Anderson of Fly Fishing Specialties came up with. And James owns Beulah, after I came on as a rep, wanted to take me on a little trip up on the road where he is. And he said, you gotta give me the materials, you gotta give me the materials for that, this euphoria. And I'm like, I don't know what the heck all this stuff is. So I had known Rick for years too. He's a really cool dude. So I got the materials for his euphoria. And here is, I don't have any of, of his original flies, but here's one that I got um, from him as an example that it can be full hackled, you can trim it to make an alvin. And so I looked at this and I thought, huh something's missing and a few years ago i was in salt lake city and at a fly shop i ran into jack dennis and we started chatting probably talked for about an hour and he has this book it's the presentation is really funky it's um held together you know with those those plastic combs like it's, it's homemade a spiral almost. bound book yeah oh, i remember that yeah, book. yeah 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 you know and i had one of those and i gave it away i thought well this is kind of dumb these are just a bunch of dumb old patterns and then I revisited that book after I saw him and I actually saw the brilliance in some of the natural material, old original patterns, especially the muddler. So I took it on, I perfected it. And then at some point, after tying a bunch of regular euphorias, these are ones that um, from the first batch that I took up to fish with James. And these are on um, steelhead irons, uh, Alec Jackson steelhead irons. They're heavier wires, so they sink really well. And they're also just tough. I mean, you could probably tow a car with those things are so strong and so i played around with that for a while and then i said well this is what we want it's we want that with a muddler head and the first <laughs> needs a little trim and it just started catching fish right out of the box i mean there were times on a couple of the wider slower um sections of uh the i don't remember the name the road <laughs> um on some of the slower sections there were times that i was catching pretty almost something on every sometimes every other cast and it could be like a salmon uh smolt or it could be um a rainbow or a, a resident cutthroat with par marks it could be a sea run but i was catching something on every cast i thought oh my god this thing is this is awesome so i kept pushing 
pushing the pattern. And then I started making some bigger ones for James for Coastal. And he sent me some really good pictures of some fish with the fly in their mouth from his camera live on some of his trips. And I started making little guys for places like the Klamath and Trinity or even just for trout. This is on a size nine steelhead iron as compared to the Big Brother 3. And this evolved to <laughs> some flies that are going to be coming out pretty soon from aqua flies, which are the trout spays. Can you see that okay? Not really. Huh? There we go. There we go. Yeah, it looks good. So is that the okay. uh, the caddis green body with a little orange butt on it? No, this is the um, the orange one I just gave you the other day. There we go. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, you know what's leaning? I'm leaning forward. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna dig right in though to uh, tying uh, this fly, and I'm going to use a steelhead iron size three, so you guys can see it. And then I'm also gonna go a little bit into how I've developed um, my fly patterns. Shane Stall taught me a lot of things, and one was not necessarily about technique, but was how to think. And so when you're developing a fly pattern. Actually, I'll show you on this guy. Some of the some of the things that I had to discover. You want to be able to produce a consistent product. And so part of what Shane told me is like when you get the bag of CDC, he'll take it and he'll clean it and he'll grade it. So he'll say, you know, this is an oiler puff, this is uh, you know, a hackling, this is, you know, he separates a an alternate um sizes and uses so what i do is i get a whole lot of packages of let's say for example teal and these are gauged out to 25 millimeters all i did was just take a regular hackle gauge and put a millimeter rule on it so you can just spin it around and see you know what pile to put it in and also i clean the feathers first too before yeah, i because when i'm tying in, in, I, I all i want to do is i want to pick up a, pick something up and be able to put it on the hook. I don't want to screw around with it, having to do extra processes that are going to take me away from focusing on what I'm working on. Oh, I should put that back in. Sorry about that. Okay. So I also want to know where I'm going to have the body end and the body start. I'm going to know where that um, butt's going to end. I want to know where the the on the bigger flies where that dubbing ball is going to end. I'm going to want to know where the um, the hackle go because I need to have room to put that mother head in. So what I did, I've tied approximately 600 of these. And here's my accumulated data, <laughs> and so I had to figure out what was the ideal for each one of these flies to have room for the mother head. And then also my um, preference is to have one hackle go to the point of the hook and. One hack will go to the barb and one go past the bend. And uh, when Rick does his euphoria, he goes longest feather first, middle feather, and then the shortest. And I'd like to go middle feather, longest, and then the shortest. I just like the way it looks when it's wet and the way it moves. But you, you want, and this my goal is to have a nice kind of airplane wing bait fish shape and also to get a lot of movement. And I noticed that the uh, muddler head creates enough turbulence. So you're tying it sparse, right? Yeah, I'm tying it sparse. And I'll, 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 tell, I'll describe exactly the sparseness when I put it together. But I'm just going to go ahead and start. So when I'm doing the butt, what I'm going to do is I want the point to be horizontal. Oh, you know, I forgot to show you some other materials too. For the butt, I'm always using... Black Ultra Thread 70. Um, I like Ultra Thread because you can the spin black, it. Ultra are you using the black 70. to start the fly? Yeah, for the butt. I do a few thread changes through this. Okay. It's kind of weird, but it'll make sense as I go. Um, I can get a nice flat bed there. I need the black because when you're working with um, any kind of flashaboo, if you have just a regular hook shank and the flashaboo's on top, it looks kind of dull. But somehow putting black thread under it makes it really vibrant. 
So let's just pop that guy in there. And what I do also is I just use the thread like a, a level. So right there, I'm at my point. So that's going to be my starting point. Let's take it back. And, you know, I'm going to talk about the vice quite a bit as I go to. This really is not how people like to use the nor vice when they're, they like to um, spin the whole hub system to build thread up. But sometimes I don't like to do that. And I'll take it back up to the front. Oh. <laughs> With these Jackson hooks, I will often, I usually turn the point away from me because these things are like a razor and I've cut myself really bad with those things before, you know, just reaching past or reaching through or holding on to materials. Okay, that's good enough. And then, um, here's another thing I do that I see a lot of tires not do is they're, they're gonna wanna try to bind that in. I say, to heck with that, I'm lazy, you know? I've already put thread there. So I just do a pull through, a bind. And then on these hooks, they're a return eye. Can you guys see that? Yeah, that little slot. Now I'm gonna use the vices, viceness. How many how um, many strands of the flashaboo you got tied in there? This one. And I'm, I'm not gonna have them touch either. I'm gonna have it spaced a little bit sparse because when I put head cement over them, if the head cement can't penetrate down into the thread and get under it, you're going to get some bubbles and it looks kind of crappy. So I want them to, I'm doing it kind of, I'm exaggerating the sparseness right now. I'm also going to grab a tool, third hand, which is awesome. And Tim from Norvice, which I think you might be watching, if you are, Notice how I have a custom made lever that clicks into the bottom of the jaw so I can do this and I don't have the fly pop out. That would be nice to have a couple more of those guys. <laughs> okay. Okay. One of Grant King's tricks. You can't really see the thread, it's so thin, but I go around the material twice and I come up with a loose thread. I do a wrap in front, a wrap in back. It's totally bound down. And I also have my material sticking out hordes uh, at a 90 degree angle. Very, very little bulk. And it's a very, very strong um, terminating wrap. Okay, so I already swapped to another thread. So I did a whip finish. I'm going to throw a little bit of some loon hard head on there. Um, I found that, and uh, Rick Anderson pointed this out too, is that um, when you're using Flashaboo as a butt, it, um, the UV stuff doesn't work very well. Uh, the hard is nails and the loon hard head are the ones we found that work really well so far. Okay, so this thread can go away for a while. Uh, so you, you prefer to do style of head cements rather than a UV head cement? Uh, no, I'll use for, the UV. For the butt? But, yeah, for the butt, because it just, I wish you guys could see this. It's glowing like a neon sign. And otherwise, you know, with um, <clears throat> with the UV stuff, it looks just kind of silvery and dull. Okay. So we decided to do what? Um, olive, Doug, on the, oh, the so next material, ice tub. Um, the main body is olive on the bigger flies. We put a pearl, a uh, uh, UV pearl ball. That'll, that'll look good. Yes. And I'm going to get rid of the excess material. I'm, I'm not going to worry about letting it fully dry. Now I move to, where are you? There you are. Ah, okay. So on a fly this size for the body, if the body is a body of, that has color, I'll use the Ultra Thread 140 white because the black kind of dulls down the color. But if I'm actually making a black body, then I'll use the U, uh, Ultra Thread 140 black. Okay, now here's another cool thing. The chart that I showed you over, uh, talked about being able to find the placement of things. This is, uh, I got this in the hardware store. This is a, a machinist rule and it's in 64ths. I'll probably get a... Uh, metric one at some point, but right there is where I want 
the body to end. Okay, so I'm gonna set my thread and locate it. It's actually moving the thread with the... Uh... Yep. Okay, now I'm gonna do the with the Norvice wood. method of getting that thread on there. It doesn't have, it, I'm just getting a, a bed for traction. You know, it's not really hiding the, it's not hiding the color of the hook. And I'm going to stop just a little bit ahead of the point because I'm going to dub up and then take, you'll see, you'll see. I'll put, get the dubbing on there. Third point away. I'm spinning the thread to round it. You know, take it away from being flat. It's kind of hard with a band aid to get that on here. And I'm going to anchor my dubbing. Perfect. So now when I twist it, it actually twists instead of just spinning on the thread. After you make a whole bunch of these, you kind of know when to stop too, as far as how far to go down the thread with the dubbing. I wonder if uh, I wonder if Rick Anderson's out there, or if Tim O'Neill is out. So if you there. have any questions, anybody, come in. We've got a live chat available, and I see uh, Jan Inge from Thailand is checked in with us. Hi, Jan. <laughs> and, uh, is that your Tim, guy? Yeah, we're having some issues with uh, the camera. It's uh, Bernie, Bernie. Bernie's kind of limited on his technology right now. <laughs> I'm too old. Okay, so. Look, this is why I love this vice. Well, one of the many reasons is it's just so easy to get stuff done and make things look really good. You know, it's like it's like I'm holding the fly in the palm of my hand. You know, it's really tactile. And I'm taking it to a stream, a lot extreme. A lot of people stay back on the hub. You know, it's okay to break through the dubbing and actually just have a couple of wraps right there as kind of like a security measure. So I'm almost up to where I want to terminate. I can add just a teeny bit more. And then you're going to see something you probably don't usually see with ice dubbing, but I'm going to trim it like deer hair. You get a nice shape. It doesn't hang, the hackles don't hang up on all that, you know, floppy stuff all over the place. It's kind of like hook and loop Velcro situation. And I, one other thing I do too is use a hair packer. Because I want, there, ooh, nice. Let me tell her back I went. We're good. Uh, yeah, good enough. Okay. Uh, uh. Um, AK Best taught me about scissors in a class that I took from him. If you take scissors and you take, let's say, one of those little diamond hook hones and you deburr it, it's the most useful tool. It makes a great half hitch tool, as you'll see right here. It makes a great bodkin. Just, it's awesome. Okay. Another wonderful Norvice feature. Don't breathe that stuff, it'll kill you. Little sparkles. Damn. Taking years off my life right now, that crap. Okay, let's clean up the front a little bit. Now we're gonna go for the little pearl section. And pearl section. So why do you um, uh, do that? Do you not want a shaggy body? Do you not? No. Doesn't it give off more light if you've got some of the fibers? No, actually, if you, you were to compare side better, by side, what's, what's your reasoning? Uh, I like the refraction and reflection better. I also like the fact that it doesn't um, tangle up the uh, hackles. Okay. Okay. So now we take the other, I'm going to stop here device and put it right there. I can remember that. I count wraps too, because I do a lot of unwinding. You'll see, especially in the hackles. So, here comes Rick's signature. Here. 
Rick's signature feature, one of its features of. So did Rick tie right? this fly originally for clam the area, or what was he uh, when he came up with this pattern? What was he? You know, thinking? I never asked. It's kind of a general pattern. Um, I wonder if he's on there. Maybe he'll pipe in. Hey, Rick. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah. Did he? Okay. Now, this one's really important. And I like to go oversized and pretty tight with it. Because when I run the packer on there, this is going to be like a fulcrum. Like, you know how you put a, a little ball of dubbing on a soft hackle to make the hackle stand out? That's what this part here does. You know, the body is not doing any of the hard lifting like this little guy is doing right here so let's get that nice and flat Ooh, not good yeah yeah i, I did uh show the bag it's a it's an older bag too it's one of the old square bags kind of okay oh that looks great the original ice time, dubbing sound now this guy gets trimmed too i think it's really cool when you have a like a not a step but almost like a seamless um joint like this it's trimmed down so that the body and the ball are exactly the same diameter looks really good in the fly bins and that's just how i like to do things Ooh, what do you think not bad huh, okay now we'll use the hardest nails. Looks good. And you another still, reason, even for, after you trimmed it, you still have a ball. Or so you could, the, yeah, with a flat face. Are you guys? Can you guys see? There we go. Wasn't looking at the output. Okay. So now I'm going to buy this down. Um, the thread changes. You know, changing threads for different materials and uh, different processes, and also oh. <clears throat> Take a look at this brush. You see, I, tr I cut it in half a little bit up. You put a notch yeah. in the in the fibers. Yeah, so that enables me to actually work on small flies. And then, if I need more material, I can just pull it down. But it gives me a smaller, you know, contact point, so I don't get too much material. And I do a lot of just taking away the excess. So we're getting into hackles now. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the thread changes. You know, like I said, it's the different processes okay, so require different threads. Moved your thread. But, Thread again? Hmm. I'm changing thread again. You changing colors of thread again? I'm gonna go to the okay. gel spun poly. Oh no no I'm I'm going to um I'm going to a black 140 for the hackles. So I'm just gonna set a little thread bit here, nothing major, and then. Okay. Um, the, 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 putting the whip finish and the, um, cement in there makes these modular such that the, the further towards the eye I get, the more chances there are to screw the fly up. And so I can just knock out one step, strip it off. And I still have, a, um, an intact fly. Um, it's really crucial on a muddler head. It's kind of hard to, to get it right on the muddler head on the first, um, try. Okay, so now we're going to be using teal. Uh, some pheasant saddle, some pheasant rump. You know, the, the packages of pheasant you get, they say pheasant rump, but they're are pheasant, yeah, pheasant rump. But the rump really is only that little crown shaped patch that is at the bottom of um, a whole pheasant tail clump. And the rest is really a saddle. I don't know what it was. Um, did we decide on orange on this, Doug? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Never mind. Orange. Okay. So, see if you can see it all right. I I strip one side. I don't like having the folded over musty must up hackles. They just don't seem to move as well. So here's what I'm going to be working with. And this is another thing that is kind of uncommon. But if you've ever worked with goose biots, you know. Or sometimes javelina, if you soak them, you can get better, like on this, I'm getting better compression on the stem when I soak it. And plus, 
um, non-dyed natural uh, either waterfowl or upland game. They're oftentimes pretty dirty, and so they don't spin that well. So I just take that dried off on my jeans a little bit. So that's enough, uh, just a few seconds on the water is enough to make it. Yeah, surprisingly. Okay, so I'll do two wraps. And then typically with the Norvice, a lot of folks will want to take the thread all the way to the thread post. But actually, that does not save me. It, it, it actually takes more time. So I'll use the third hand on this instead of a, um, a heckle plier. And I'm going to do two turns. Ow. Dang, it's sharp. Spread them out. And I don't want to go past two turns, so I'm going to strip some of this off. It's got to be a good-looking fly. I don't I don't fish at least flies. Okay, I'm going to do that Grant King thing again. You know, with that dark thread, you can't see very well. So the thread is actually, the, the feather is held by one wrap and its own stem. So there's almost no bulk. So I went around it twice. I have a slack thread and I go up and over. And then here's, oh, this is, this is so awesome that you can do this with a Norvice, is I can print it and get a, a decent distribution. You don't, want a, you don't want a complete perfect distribution. You want some gaps, but you want a, don't want a big ugly gap sitting there because you're going to hate the fly. You know, fish, they don't give a darn, but... You're just going to go, wow, that's not really nice. Next, pheasant, same thing. Pheasant is about the dirtiest feather I've ever encountered as far as sticking together and having clumps and mud and God knows what else on it. So let's see how this one looks. That looks really good. Nice size. Nice size. How are we doing for time, Doug? That's the natural color, right? That's not dyed, is it? No. No, that's another one of my specialties is dyeing materials. Um, I have a degree in math, finance, and accounting, but I snuck in almost an art degree. And so I learned um, color theory. And color theory is like the keys to the kingdom for dyeing materials. And that's another thing that Shane Falkup and I talked about quite a bit. I mean, if you take an out, if you take like an out of the package dye, you may be happy with the color, but usually you got to adjust, adjust it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Edward Howell, thank you for joining us. Bruce Berry. Hey, Bruce, how you doing, man? Uh, uh, James, uh, you yes, kind of across uh, my speaker and that went out to uh, both the video, I, I think. used uh, when we learned from Grant King. Okay. Oh, that is nice. Very nice. So I'll use that little, uh, I call it the helicopter wrap just because you're spinning around like a helicopter blade. I don't know what else to call it, but it's just so efficient and works so well. So strong too. So now I'm getting my hackles pretty again. I wonder if Norvice is going to have a special lever for deer and weird things like this hmm hmm okay so to, pay the, to uh, do the pattern true to form at this point i'll put some flash in you know it's uh, same the same same uh flash of boo that i used for the butt and i'll show What's again the flash that... material? oh okay Of course, it's a, uh, it's his fly that I, I'm standing on his shoulders with this fly, you know, great. Okay. So yeah, that's, I, I'm the, I, this is the lazy man method and this works better than anything I've ever done is you just bring it through. I think wrap there. Whoops. I didn't lock my clutch. There we go. Um, I, I recommend the Norvice wholeheartedly to everybody. And there's a little bit of a learning curve. But once you get used to it, your left little finger is your clutch foot, like in a car. 
and you can have that clutch in and out so fast. So now we got the flash. Now the flash, if you put it um, in front of the top layer of feathers, see how it's kind of like sticking up like horns? It just looks crappy. So it's better to have a layer there over that. Now we're coming with the orange. Um, the dunking is really helpful on guinea because the guinea is so tough. I mean, the stem is like steel. It's unbelievable. You, you hardly break the stuff with your fingers. And it doesn't compress very well. But just that little dunking, and it really seems to soften it up. I got to save my breath for the deer hair part. <laughs> hey, that looks pretty good. Okay, and two turns of that. And we are... Functionally, pretty much just at the Anderson Euphoria, you know, non muddler stage of the pattern. Oh, that's good. Do you think it should go a little bit longer on the guinea? Kind of the point. How's it look? Does it look right? Looks a little short. That's what looks I thought. A little short. All right. Let's just redo that. If it's too short, then uh, the deer hair will obscure it, and then you won't see it. And the deer hair is going to end up about halfway from the, at the most halfway from the tie-in point to the actual hook point, so it's going to end up about here, ideally. This looks about right, mm -hmm. you think? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I strip one side. I always strip one side. I keep forgetting that I'm off camera there. Donkey donk. Um, with the ultra thread right now, I have the flat or the floss. It slides around, so I have to I had to spin it to round it so I can get a good bite. Oh, that's perfect right there where I want it. Hopefully, I got enough on there for two turns. I think so. Um, Rick's flies are, uh, they are not stripping one side, so they have twice as much volume of hackle. Put that in, there we go. But I really like sparse. So he, he likes a heavier hackle fly than what you like to, to fish? Yeah, or maybe it costs more, I don't know, maybe it's not cost effective to have people strip for something. But okay, so here we go. Let's go. We're just virus. Come on. Nice. Very nice. I've had, let's see, I've been using the Norvice since the mid 80s. I had the old um, thumb wheel. It was annoying, but it was better than my uh, Dyna King that I had. I think I had number, Dyna King number 235 or something. Um, most people don't know this, but the Dyna King was made by a guy named Rob Abbey. Uh, was he in Santa Rosa? Uh, Clover. Um, it was Clover. It, it was it was Grant King's you know pet project vice for tying his um saltwater and other. Actually, it was for, he had it made for everything he likes to tie anywhere from like little trout flies to saltwater flies. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. What do you think? Okay, a little bit of the hard as nails. I like it. Looks good. Well, I still use my original Dyna King that Grant gave me. Oh, it's number ninety-eight. Oh my God! It's original jaws, original cup. Works for I everything. Bet, I bet you, if you were to attach that to the roof of a Volkswagen Beetle, and put a strong enough hook in it, you could probably lift the Beetle with the jaws of that vice. What do you think, Doug? <laughs> Does that sound about right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now we're going to totally change a yeah, lot they of are tough here. as nails. So, these are uh, from the taqueria of a local store. I have kits, okay? So this is my kit I put together. You can't really quite see anything, but there's this a bag of all the right feathers. Everything fits in the loop. I'm done. That thing gets lit aside. Now we're going to move over to 
your hair work. So, you know, we have definitely have our stacker. This is a Tiny King stacker, Doug. This is from Ron Abbey from way back when, from the 80s. I have a little Stonfo comb that I use for cleaning and for manipulating the hair and, you know, detangling it. And this is a Stonfo deer hair trimmer. It weighs probably four ounces, and I would not wear shorts or flip flops when using this because. What kind of deer hair do you like to use? Um, for anything size uh, five and larger, I'll use the uh, Primo from Hairline. Was it fifteen bucks okay. for is a patch? Is that a is that a coastal deer hair whitetail? What is that? Uh, this is whitetail, and this one's bleached because this pattern really okay. doesn't look right with that. When I go smaller, um. Here's some coastal. Mm -hmm. Here, let me put them side by side. You can see the difference in length. Oh, no, the orange will probably show it better. See the how long these guys are? And these are much, much shorter. Yeah. Also, in deer hair, let's see, you can see the tip. Where the, the tip is solid, and when you get the color transition from the body to... um. The, the you know the uniform color kind of dull colored um, hollow part right there is a really good tie-in point so what i'm going to try to do is i'm going to try to get the um the color transition right here so i'm going to end up with the deer here coming back you know probably about there just maybe twice the distance of that ball and you can get pretty i have some stuff that's pretty small like for the super super small guys i have some coastal deer hair hawk Okay. My friend Jeltman Polly. Hunter Denier. Where are you? Oh, here we go. Hunter Denier Jeltman Polly. What Denier did it's you great. switch to for the uh the deer a hundred oh okay it's fun yeah yeah it's as a thread i hate it you know it slides around it's aggressive it cuts things it's good for the deer hair because i can um have something fairly small in diameter that really digs in and hold the deer hair in place but i finish with ultra thread over it because it just doesn't look right um i've tried using the GSP that's quote unquote dyed black. And the dye is, it, it doesn't penetrate the fibers. It's more like sort of a dipped coating. And I end up with a lot of it down in the bobbin tube. And it ends up gray and blotchy. So um, yeah. I just use a black Sharpie. Oh, just use a black Sharpie on the white um, yeah. GSP? Yeah. Because um, it, it looks terrible when you, you know, when you're looking at a fly and you see like white thread or something bright coming from underneath something, you know, like a thread gap. But you're going you're gonna to have thread gaps definitely mm -hmm. with the deer hair. Right. Okay. Let's see, we got these guys, these guys, these guys. Now it's time to select some. This is where things get um, challenging. So on a fly of this size, I'm going to start with a pretty good size clump. That's fatter than a pencil, okay? And I'm going to cut it right down to the skin because I don't want that messy stuff sitting there impeding future cuts. Oh, this is going to be messy. And to clean deer hair, just grab it and just start pulling out the under hairs. Because there, there are shorter hairs. There's also stuff that's almost like dog fur in there. It's kind of weird. You know, I guess they are very thermally really efficient creatures. I used to have a um, little tiny <laughs> mustache. I can hear James. He should be turned off. 
And then full stone folk comb is really good for cleaning it a little more. I don't know if I have enough on here. Let's find out. Yeah, it right. feels about right. Okay. Dear hair stacker, you just pound on the table and tell. So you <laughs> okay, so I take my pinch and I flatten it and try to get the tips you know pretty the at the same place it doesn't really matter that much because the fly ends up kind of shaggy and kind of yeah funny looking you know you want it to be to kind of be like nails on a chalkboard scratching in the water so to speak so mm -hmm. okay i'm just past that just past the ball so i'm gonna hold it so it's you know around much of the hook shank and i'm gonna do, do two super loose wraps and when the thread comes back to me I can distribute it. And here's another hit. This is where the Norvice just really shines. It's working with this stuff. What do you think? Nice, huh? Okay. So at this point, I'm gonna trim this so I can work I can worm the thread down through it. I'm gonna take a look at my distribution here from the side. Beautiful. That's not bad. And I'm going to put some tension on it, comb it out. How's the time look, Doug? Awesome. Thank you. Okay, it's pretty, good. pretty so even. Have you had uh, you know problems with the DSP cutting into the uh, deer hair at all? If I go below or 100, just yeah, take, terrible. Like if I use 70 or 50. You try to uh, put too much pressure on them? I put a lot of pressure. But if I, if I go, like I said, if I go smaller than 100, if I do 70 or 50, it just, it shears the deer hair right off. Okay, okay. Ooh, that looks good. So now I'm going to apply a fair amount of tension to anchor it right there. That's exactly where I want it to be. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I can do this from above. I'm worming it through. And I'm only picking up a couple hairs in each layer. And here's another awesome thing about the Norvice is I can manipulate the deer hair as I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. At least with um, the uh, vice or the jaw handle that I have. Um, so I'm creating like a bottle brush effect and I'm creeping the deer hair up towards the eye. So I don't just have the deer hair folding over, but I've got a bunch of short sections that are separated well. Does that kind of make sense? And you want it to look kind yes. of like those... Yeah, yeah, um, I could, yeah. You're, you're kind of going through it. It's going to end up looking kind of like those, uh, I think they're called a Webster, those spider web balls, you know, broom things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to do these just to keep things from coming apart. Now I'm going to check. Ooh, not bad. I'm not seeing thread hardly at all. And I'm going to pack it back. And then I'm going to anchor the heck out of it with the gel spun poly and kind of compress it and just give myself a bed of that. And now I'm going to come in with my 70 denier. Let's go with the 140. There's enough room to work there. On smaller flies, you definitely have to use the 70. Yeah, uh, you just get a much, much better finish from the ultra thread than you do from the gel spun poly. Now I'm going to do that Grant King trick again, which he first showed me this trick for when you have a problem with a thread breaking and you have to restart another thread. So I'll just let it spin around twice. Front or back front. Um, here is a uh, from AK Best is I'm not going to close my scissors. I'm just going to push them so I don't lose all that wonderful good work. Get this so uh, on larger flies, you do more than uh, one station of, of deer hair, or do you try to keep the deer hair super sparse, even on the big flies? Oh, 
Uh, same technique on all of them. Yeah. Um, it's not very often that I will go through the whole process. Mm -hmm. These are some prototypes that I tied for Ricketts Specialties. They're on um, partridge clink hammers. They're small. Um, Doug and I decided mm -hmm. these were not cost effective for to be able to put in production. But these are waiting for their mother heads. Uh, Rick's probably sitting here thinking, hmm, my little baby girl needs a birthday present. His daughter, who's a, just a killer kid and it can fly cast really, really well. Um, <laughs> yeah, I do. I typically do like a whole bunch of just one stage. So I do all butts. You know, all hackles, all bodies. Um, yeah. Here's a, so this is the equivalent of a forcep, but it has no grooves. And it's called a, a, a needle clamp. And it's what they use for holding a needle when they're suturing. And what I like the needle clamp for is when you have little stragglers, they're going to be a pain. You can go in and just spin them out. Mm-hmm. Let's sharp. Okay, let's go up ahead. Wow, we're just getting started with the fun part. That looks pretty good. A whip finish with the AK Best Whip Finish Special Tool. Ta da! You don't do it by hand. Didn't hmm? Grant tell you to do it by hand? Yeah, but I like to I like to place it with the scissors. Ah, uh, okay, got you. Because on some you know these are these are pretty, there's a lot of room up there to work but sometimes when you have to be close and really precise mm -hmm. uh, it's very helpful to do that okay it's going to take a sec for this to harden enough for me to trim the deer here what else should we take a look at i won't trim the deer hair without the head cement on because there have been times that i've nicked the thread oh. And there are certain reserved words for those types of moments that I won't share with you right now. <laughs> um, well, actually, I've got a pretty good story. Oh, we're waiting for that to dry. This is one of my earlier Model U4 is. It's in Claret. And Rick had a name for this. What the heck was it? Uh, the Yo Play. There's right. there. Hmm. There's a lot of feathers on there. Yeah, it's tied it's like his a feather way. duster. It's yeah. a it's a witch's broom too. I mean, I I wasn't I didn't know what the heck I was doing, so I um was brought in as a fill in because they didn't have enough bodies for the 2018 Team USA Nationals up in Bend, which is pretty cool because for a couple hundred bucks for the entry fee, I got four half days on a boat. <laughs> In different lakes, we did um, Crane Prairie, Lava Lake, North and South Twin. Um, North Twin was just stupid. It's a lake that's really shallow and sandy at one end, and it gets deeper and then it goes to a really steep rock bank. And we had to, against a steep rock bank, we had to wait and cast in the lake. And there were all kinds of trees back. There was not enough room. A lot of the guys, their rods were underlined, so they were false casting and ending up in the bushes and just having a really bad day. And I was there just to have fun. I mean, I didn't want right, to screw up anybody. I'll, I'll let Bernie know that you're his favorite Beulah rep. <laughs> well, what? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so anyway, long story short, I was there pretty much to have fun. I mean, a lot of people spend a lot of time and money to qualify and all that. And so I'm like, all right, type of, let's, let's do something. Let's get some big, big fish going on here. So I took a Beulah five weight switch rod and a Rio single hand spay 3D, which is a, uh, I think, lever to intermediate, but it's a sink tip. About half of the head is a sink tip. So you have 15 feet of sink. So I took this exact fly with the barb pinch down, put it on there, did uh, one of my crappy, single spay, the kind of casting I do that James hates, he gets mad when I do it. And I <laughs> gave it about a 20 second countdown and I caught a trout that was well into the 20 inches <laughs> in a lake with right. this fly. Can you believe that? With the, the, the claret fly, yeah. Yeah, with this exact So what's the fly. body on that? Is it a dark body and the claret happily? Yeah, it's a, it's a black body. 
and it's on now this was on a steelhead iron but the point is that this isn't limited to just steelhead i mean this is a good trout pattern it can be a lake pattern um i'm working on sure. some lake patterns for somebody for competition these are a caddis pattern basically it's a muddled euphoria um it's like i don't know size eight or something regular wet fly hook here's one with the head on it you'd be surprised what soft tackles will do in a lake Okay, we start the deer hair trimming. So first I like to groom the hair and get it standing up pretty well. And I'm going to be cutting from the back of the fly with my um, scissor angled so that I kind of make that ball shape but just smaller. So I'm going to be cutting. Let me see if I can get up there. You can see from there kind of. Now I've got a heard me have a thread peekaboo. Um, another cool thing about these flies is once you get them wet and the deer hair soaks up, it all seems to fill in the gaps and really take a good shape. When it's dry, you know, it's kind of uh, bed hair, kind of, you know, just woke up kind of a thing. And I'm going to start thinning out because I, I want that deer overwing to be consistent with, I want it to act like another layer of sparse hackle you know, at least aesthetically. Okay, now I'm gonna come in with a Stonfo trimmer. Mm -hmm. um, I have another trimmer. It's the one that's kind of shaped like a U. It's springy metal, but you can't hold other tools in your hand. I feel weird if I don't have scissors in my hand, but this tool fits the hand so well. It's so easy to change the blade. All you have to do is unscrew this. You can pop the blade out of the two little uh, hangers there and go to the other side or put a new one in. So now I'm gonna just start shaping. Um, Self-restraint is good. Don't try to take a lot in one pass on these. Okay. Um, a straight eye is easier. So why don't you just start uh, trimming the deer hair with the tool bef before you uh, trim it with scissors? Be uh, a couple reasons. I want I want to have a I want to have a good um visual reference of where I am with regards to getting close to the shank. And you don't get that many flies out of the blade. Deer hair is a lot tougher mm -hmm. than human hair. And it really dulls the blade in a hurry. So now I'm going to do something. It's kind of oh. like if you've ever worked, um, you know, concrete or anything, it's called a screen yeah. board. And it's like the board you put at the edges that you use to, to level and shape, you know, like a, a patio or something. So I call this like my screen board cut. For the next pass. Now I'm going to take it down a little bit more. I'm so afraid of dropping this thing. Sometimes I'll put like a towel on my lap because I'm sure this will go right through jeans and right into my leg. Great tool though. Is that showing up okay, Doug? I thought you didn't wear pants when your time flies. But how would we know? Today I am. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting in really good shape on that. <laughs> no, it's like uh, you need to be wearing like almost welding armor. Okay. I'm going to do another shape up here. <laughs> um, I don't cut corners. I, I like to do everything 110%. You think, Doug? Ooh, liking that. Okay, so now I'm going to rough it up a little bit by just doing some... So, Bernie, if uh, somebody doesn't have the the tool... The razor blade tool, what would you recommend they, they the do to get that shape on the head? Just use scissors? The, ra the razor blade tool. <laughs> you can do it with scissors. It's just, it's. You, you, I don't think you'll get as much precision. It depends. If you want like a, a shaggy, kind of ratty looking head, which is actually a good thing. I'm just a perfectionist and my stuff has to, you know, 
Ooh, what do you think, Doug? Mm -hmm. All right. I am going to dunk this and let's see what Love it does. It. And that, that's my real test is I dunk it and soak it and pull it out and see what the profile is like. Okay. So in you go. You're going to stay there for a while. Um, Doug, do you have any other like, questions? Or by, by you? What? Hmm? What? Here is another thing I like these needle clamps for. Oh. Let's see if I can get this in my hand so you guys can see it. That looks very yeah. good. Look at that profile. I think I can catch a fish with there that. There we go, there we go, there we go. Don't you have some pictures? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, Ed, I don't know if you heard uh, what Bernie had to say, but he would recommend just continuing to trim with the scissors if you don't have a razor blade available. Um, is there anything? Do have what? Oh, yes. These are standard length. Um, Do you prefer a certain style of scissors or brand? Yeah, tungsten carbide. And what I like to do on the tungsten carbide is, let me grab something to show you real quick. Is I have some really cheap diamond files made in, you know, cheap land. Can you kind of see the coarseness of that? And what I do is I use those to sharpen this but what it does is it breaks off little chunks of that of the um of the 90 degree cutting edge so you actually end up with a serrated scissor so the material doesn't slide around as bad um even deer hair it actually the gel spun poly where uh, will dull scissors super quick and the deer hair will will too so i'm um sharpening quite a bit mm -hmm. well this looks like a good fish mouth uh pose here doesn't it Pretty good. Um, uh, you can Amy, drop that off at my place, and I'll take it out when the once uh, the uh, shelter <laughs> in place order. Um, you mean the different colors and things? Oh, sure. You know what, James? You're coming out on the speaker. I think you're coming across on YouTube too. Okay, so these are a bunch of size fives. And I played around with a whole bunch of different colors. Um, I really like olive and orange together. James is pretty fond of purple and black. Um, I play oh, 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 oh. This is another one that Doug has in production. This is this is James's personal fly. Okay, this is his green butt skunk, Silver Hilton, who the heck knows? And that's his go-to. And you know what? I've got some awesome pictures of this thing in the corner of some fishes and mouths and some coastal water. A great fly. Um, it's the same exact fly, except I take saddle hackle tips and I put them shiny side out together. And if you don't have any experience with saddle hackle tips, if you have like a piece of glass or some sort of smooth, hard surface, and you can take like the round edge of this or maybe the back of the spoon or whatever, and you stand your feather up the way you want it to go, and you get your stem down on the surface, and you rub it till it's flat. And then you do that slide through like I did, and that feather sits upright exactly where you want it. Otherwise, it's a nightmare. Um, I think that was another Grant King trick. I'm not sure. Um, we've got some coastal that ones. That one I for, had not heard before. Coastal ones for, experimental ones for James and, and Rick. Orange with pink. Winter, you know, coastal, let's see. Claret and red. These are uh, size threes oh, yeah. like the one that I tied. 
Um, hey, we have Susan Smith joining us. She's all the way up yeah. in northern BC. She owns uh, Shook Wind Outfitters. Thanks for joining. Oh, awesome. Um, I heard you say something, James. What was that? Okay. Okay. Um, after this, we'll be posting the materials list. Um, let's see what else. And this right here. Yes, we'll post the materials list. This right here. Be sure to join us uh, next week with uh, Amy Hazel and Bruce Berry. They'll be tying next week, Tuesday at five o'clock. Cool. Um, and let me talk about the vice for just a sec. I was coming back. Thanks everybody um, for joining. Okay, go. All right. So as I was driving back from Oregon one time, um, I became pretty good friends. I became good friends with a guy named Mike McCoy. He owns Snake Brand Guides. And he was my controller um, at the 2018 Team USA Nationals. And so I was bored. I'm driving home. So I'm talking to him on the phone. And he mentioned something about um, Norman Norlander having passed away. And I just freaked out. It's the best vice. He was such a cool dude. And... Um, I think I, I think I was on my, I have to, I need a lot of things when I like them. So I need to have replication, but I was afraid I wouldn't be able to get parts or, you know, anything from that point forward. Not like I really needed them. It's just, I was just really upset. So I ended called and I ended up finding out that I talked to Tim O'Neill who purchased the company and he has been keeping my vice alive. And so I decided to uh, come on with him as a rep, like I did with Norm and, just a real shout out to you, Tim. Thank you so much for just preserving the legacy of this. This is the most amazing tying tool I've ever used. Um, you have a lot of different jaws you can put on here. There's um, a small fly jaw, which I don't use because I can tie with this thing down to, uh, where are my little babies? Here we go. Here's a beta soft hackle. I don't know if you guys can even see it. Let me grab it with the needle clamps. Uh, he's got a tube fly vice. He's working on a lot of things. And the bobbin enables me to do a lot of things that I wouldn't even bother trying. Can you guys see that little guy? Yeah, yeah, that's nice. So I use these jaws to tie this fly. Very, very comfortable. Um, some people like having uh, the, the, the small fly jaws have like a traditional jaw angle, which I think a lot of people, once they get used to it, that's what they're going to like to tie with. He's got tube fly, um, a dubbing brush table um saltwater large hook uh jaws and all you do is you just take out this sorry about this guys just take out this little oh yeah the set screw a lot of hex yeah. in there and you can jaws, yeah and you just right. pop out the set screw because he has a flat face on it um and the thing i mean this one is over 20 years old it runs like it's brand new these things are totally, totally bulletproof. Um, but this this tactile rolling and moving, I don't think I'd even I, I don't think I'd even enjoy tying fly as I had these right after using this one. Um, you get a chance to check one out or you're interested or whatever, just give Tim a shout out or, or me or something. And let's see. Oh, and Doug, do you want do you want to talk about aqua flies? So um, my patterns are sold two shops from aqua flies do you sell direct too i don't think so do you yeah so bernie's patterns are available at several several shops um all the way you know from california all the way up to british columbia up to the bulkley um you know, guys are really Russia? liking them up in bc late fall fish it's tied on a tied on a heavy enough hook for large steelhead All right. Thank you very, very much. And yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, be sure to be with us next week. Yep. Hang out. Hang out with Bruce and Amy next week, and have a good, a good week sheltering at home. <laughs>